Good morning. We are starting the second day of the conference. The subject of uh, the panel is the future of nuclear deterrence, regional challenges. I think uh, the logic behind uh, this subject is quite clear. We have not only academic interest in the subject of uh, nuclear deterrence or non-conventional deterrence, but uh, what motivates us is the concern that uh, sometime in the future we will have to face a reality in which uh, there are uh, nuclear powers in the Middle East and uh, then we like to have uh, the tools that will enable us to analyze this situation and to see, to try to understand whether, whether strategic stability can be achieved in such a situation. One of the ways of doing it is looking at the experience in other areas. And we choose three areas. One of them is the classical case of Europe, NATO, which I am not so sure is similar enough to the situation that we can foresee in the Middle East, but we can learn uh, mostly about uh, the efficacy of extended deterrence. The second one is East Asia, the case of uh, North Korea. And the third one is the Indian Peninsula, India vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. We'll start with Europe. The first uh, speaker is Dr. Bruno Tertre, and that is first an old friend. That is not so important but he is also a senior research fellow at the Foundation pour la Recherche Stratégique, FRS, and he had a very rich career in academia as well as in government, in the French Ministry of Defense. Uh, he will speak about extended uh, deterrence in the context of Europe NATO. Please, Bruno. Thank you, Slomo. Good morning to all. Look, this used to be a fairly boring topic, uh, very repetitive. It has now become mildly more interesting, so I accepted the uh, invitation with pleasure. Uh, let me make five points. Uh, first of all, a reminder, an important one, which is, uh, I think, something also we can discuss in comparing Europe with other regions. Nuclear weapons are just one component of extended deterrence. This has always been the case. One very important component of extended deterrence during the Cold War, for instance, was the so-called reforger exercises, return of forces to Germany. The fact that the US demonstrably brought back a huge contingent uh, of, of uh, ground forces and air forces to Central Europe and exercise collective defense was a very important component of extended deterrence. Now, today we have a new component of extended deterrence, which is missile defense. Missile defense matters as much, if not more, on the reassurance side than for deterrence matters. Actually, it's not meant to be a deterrent. But on the extended deterrence domain, it's a huge component of reassurance. The reason why some of our Eastern European allies want to have components of missile defense on their side is because it is an American component, and therefore it's an American physical presence. Um, the challenge for us today is, I would argue, not so much for us Europeans, is not so much about deterrence of classic aggression as per the, uh, how do you apply extended deterrence to so-called 21st century threats? And I'm thinking in particular of two areas which are strangely connected. One is deterring cyber attacks, especially state-sponsored cy cyber attacks, and the other is deterring little green men. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the expression little green men, we're talking about people with strange outfits which strangely resembles those of former Spetsnaz or uh, GRU or FSB people who are a small number of Russian operatives directing the uh, operations taking place in uh, Ukraine. Little, how do you deter little green men? How do you extend deterrence? to little green men. I don't know how to do that. I would argue that from a European standpoint today, 
this is perhaps even more important than the nuclear component. My second point is a reminder. Extended deterrence in Europe does not rely only on the United States. The UK has, in the NATO procedures, exactly the same status as the United States. Granted, it's not politically as important, it's not strategically as important, but there are two nuclear powers which have exactly the same status in the NATO um, procedures. France is part of the picture, but it's in its own funny, interesting way. We were completely part of the picture in the mid-60s, from 64 to 67. You actually had French planes carrying American nuclear bombs. Uh, then something happened, and that what happened may resonate in this country in the sense that you know, we were saying to our American friends, we love you guys, we're allies, but we don't think that any country in the world could put its survival on the line for the sake of the survival of another country. So we, by the way, it's the goal speaking, but you know, he can say we because it's the goal. We don't think, it's not about you, it's about me. It's not about the United States. It's about the very principle of extended deterrence. De Gaulle did not believe in extended deterrence. And there's something very funny about a diplomatic cable which was recently declassified a few months ago that I need to send you guys. It's a De Gaulle-Ben-Gurion conversation where De Gaulle is trying to tell Ben-Gurion, well, you don't really need a nuclear option. You have the American extended deterrent. Yeah. And you read it, you feel like... The, he, he can't believe it. He can't be serious. So. Be back to NATO. Uh, since 1974, there has been an official recognition by all allies that France, like the UK, plays a broader role, even though France is not in the nuclear uh, procedures of the alliance. But both France and the UK, because of their independent role, do play a role in uh, alliance security, and therefore, in a sense, in the, in the extended deterrence uh, process. There is something interesting uh, that came up after the Cold War. Uh, I had discussions with Soviet general. They were still Soviet. This is 1919. Uh, and they said, well, maybe it was just to, maybe just to, to please me. But what they said is, look, the Americans, we thought we knew how they operated, and we thought we knew what would happen in crisis time, or if, heaven forbid, war came to the continent. But the French, we were never so sure. So you were the wild card. And we didn't know how to handle you, of how we would have handled you in time of war. Now, of course, I was like, wow, this is fantastic. That means that deterrence, our deterrence worked. That was our game, to complicate, to complicate Soviet planning and Soviet thinking. Now, I haven't researched into the the subject enough so that I can know whether this was sincere or, or th whether this was shared or not by uh, the Soviet leadership. But that's an interesting um, element in the overall thinking of about uh, extended deterrence in Europe. Third point, the NATO deterrent is a unique system which has no equivalent in the world. It's based on four distinct elements, the permanent basing of American nuclear weapons in Europe, the procedure known as nuclear sharing, whereby non-nuclear countries can actually have uh, carry uh, nuclear weapons on their aircraft. The third is a common doctrine or nuclear concept, so to say. And the fourth is the so-called snow-cut procedure, whereby uh, non-nuclear countries, even if they don't carry nuclear weapons, could be brought online to exercise collective deterrence collectively and participate in the nuclear mission even though they don't carry nuclear uh, weapons. It's also an elaborate system of alerts, uh, demonstrations in crisis time, strategic communications. This is the products of decades of nuclear learning. Uh, the question of nuclear learning was uh, discussed yesterday it took decades for the Europeans and the Americans, uh, yes, and the Canadians, um, there's always someone of Canadian origin, so, so, uh, to, uh, to be able to agree on a number of principles. And this 
It's actually came in several different waves, but it's only by the end of the Cold War, in the mid-80s, that I think the NATO countries were satisfied with their collective deterrent system. By the way, um, I, my personal thesis on this is that the NATO doctrine worked too well. We managed to persuade the Soviets that we would start using nuclear, nuclear weapons after three, four, or five days of fighting. But because the Soviets believed we would do it, they were planning on a massive preemptive strike. But we didn't know that. We only learn after the fact. It's an interesting coda to the notion that indeed the Cold War was dangerous, and I think it was Patricia who mentioned it. No, the Cold War was complicated, not stable, and we uh, we know that now. We don't. We shouldn't, and we shouldn't forget it. My fourth point is that the the debate on extended nuclear deterrence in Europe extended deterrence in Europe, not only nuclear, tends to happen in isolation from the rest of the world, but it should not. Uh, let me say a couple of words about Asia. As you may know, Asia looks at the European debate. I mean, Japan and South Korea look at the U European debate. We tend to forget that. We Europeans tend to forget that. Only well-informed analysts such as such as us collectively here, know about it, but few people realize it. It's because of the extended deterrence issue in Asia that the U.S. has firmly committed itself to modernizing the two components of the nuclear extended deterrence, that is, you know, next, next generation aircraft, the JSF, and the consolidation of the B-61 bomb models. I also think that what happens in Europe can impact Asia. Uh, we can have an endless discussion on the, on the issue of reputation and whether American actions and French actions and British actions in one area of the world affect our reputation in other parts of the world. I know this is a huge discussion today whether what the US does or does not do in Syria impacts what's happening in Asia or in Europe. I would just say at this point that it's impossible to have certainties. And we should all be aware of um, fast-track analysis which indicate that, oh, if the U.S. doesn't act in Syria, it gravely endangers its reputation as a protector in other parts of the world. It's, I think it's true to some extent. I'm just saying that it's an issue that may be more complex than, than, meets, than meets the eye. Uh, the Middle East also looks at what's happening in Europe, but I, I doubt that the connections are so important that actors in other regions make strategic decisions based principally on what they've seen in other regions. By the way, um, regarding the Middle East, I know of at least one Gulf country which has made a request to a high-level alliance official saying we would like to have the same thing in our region. We are ready to welcome nuclear armed plane. This was a very high-level meeting. Uh, apparently, that Gulf country didn't know much about what it meant, what it entailed. I think the lesson from that conversation was that Gulf countries want to have are uh, desperate to get any kind of security guarantee of whatever shape, form, and nature. And hell, for what I know, having the Louvre in Abu Dhabi is also part of a security guarantee. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's serious. I mean, we can have a conversation about it, but it's not, uh, it's not entirely a joke. It's not entirely a joke. But I think that we have to have some, we all criticize, I mean, we do, Israelis do, French do, uh, the, the, the United States, especially under Obama. But I, I must say that the U.S. has an impossible task. It has an impossible job because of the multiplicity of its commitments around the world. Whatever it does, uh, it's going to be criticized because another region thinks that if the U.S. rebalances towards one region, then the other region think, oh, they're less interested about me. And then when that region says, 
When the U.S. says you know, to its Middle East or European friends, well, no, 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 we're not abandoning you, then Asia says, ah, you see the rebalancing is not serious. Because we're so much used to think about in these issues about in zero-sum games that um, you know, it tells you a lot about the sensitivity, of course, of allies to any kind of uh, move or apparent move in U.S. strategic policy. But I think it's very difficult it's almost an impossible task for the United States to be able to persuade all of its allies that it maintains the same level of security guarantees all around the world. <coughs> My fifth point is about the future of the European debate. Um, we may be on the verge of a rejuvenated, a reinvigorated extended deterrence debate in Europe. It actually comes at a time where on the nuclear front, the procedures, doctrine, and consultation mechanisms have been updated. This happened in 2012. And now we have the Ukraine crisis. Now, the Ukraine crisis will have an impact on extended terms, but I, it's too early to say which one. I would argue that the Ukraine crisis already has a nuclear dimension. Uh, nuclear weapons and extended deterrence define the boundaries of what's possible and not possible, thinkable and not thinkable, between NATO and Russia. I would have said the same, by the way, during the Georgian crisis. The other nuclear dimension um, is not the question of Ukrainian leftover, leftover arsenal. And I think Alexei, we should thank Alexei for having made a very good point about this uh, yesterday. Uh, Russia has made intensive use of nuclear signaling over the past two years. This is interesting. This is not the way we Europeans think. We don't think in these terms, you know, shooting a missile, testing a missile at the appropriate moment. We don't think about it. So we tend to not notice. Uh, only, uh, you know, only analysts uh, look at these things and f few officials do. But I think the NATO debate is just starting. So far, it's mostly on the conventional side and also on the missile defense side. It's not so much on the nuclear side. So interestingly enough, that's because we're in 2014, not in 1984. The nuclear element of the new extended deterrence debate has been secondary, has taken a back seat. By the way, it's OK with me. Um, I don't think the. Oh, great, I still have five minutes. <laughs> That's the good, you thought it was bad news for me, it's good news. Huh? But clearly, a number of us have said it, the debate on the withdrawal of American nuclear weapons from Europe is over, for now. I mean, it's over for at least a few years. I'm not the only one who have said it, many people have said it. Uh, it's, it's a recurrent debate, you know, uh, there's a cottage industry about NATO nuclear weapons. You know, people funded by whatever Quaker Foundation write the same paper all over and all over and all over and, they, and, and get away with it. I, this is a great way to, and I'd like to be in their line of work now. Uh, we should, Camille, we should think about getting into that debate now. The question will be whether at some point some European countries ask for a reopening of the 1997 NATO-Russia Founding Act. As many of you know, the Founding Act, including two reassurance provisions, to Russia. One was a commitment to not base significant military forces on the territory of the so-called new members, that is Eastern European countries. The second was the so-called three no's. NATO has no intention, no plan, no reason to base nuclear weapons on the territory of new members. Uh, that debate can, will perhaps be reopened. It's not I don't know how things will play out in the coming months. Uh, then there's also the question of how much the Ukraine debate will affect the intra-alliance debate on the funding of the next, next generation of nuclear-capable aircraft. But to conclude on the U Ukrainian question, let me add something which is directly relevant to our debate about complex deterrence equation. I think that we can no longer say with confidence that the nuclear debate, the nuclear deterrence debate in Europe is based on the assumption of shared rationality. I'm not saying that Russia is an irrational country, but I'm worried about uh, a number of things. When 
Angela Merkel reported to Barack Obama that Vladimir Putin was, quote, in another world, in his own world. That's not reassuring for the sane and safe exercise of deterrence. And a number of us, again, have said the same thing, but, you know, my, my uh, initial, uh, my learning experience on geopolitics was the Balkans from 1990 to 1992. And I traveled extensively to these places, and it was a, an eye-opener in many respects. And a lot of what I see now in Ukraine reminds me of the Balkans in the early 90s. And the, I'm afraid we're getting into a, a phase of the crisis where even actors who think they have a grip on things are losing their grip on things because they have unleashed passions and feelings which cannot be controlled. When you have priests, philosophers, and poets being part of the game, the assumption of shared rationality can disappear very uh, quickly. And it should, we should bear in mind in that respect that we thought we understood the Soviets. We now know that we were wrong. We were wrong because we would never have imagined that the Soviets saw us as potential aggressors. The cognitive biases in deterrence thinking are huge. And I'm, you know, I do believe that nuclear deterrence is important, but I'm also very much aware of its limitation. By the way, I agree with Patricia uh, that game theory was one of the worst things that happened to nuclear deterrence thinking. My, I don't think of chaos theory, by the way, I, I took a high-intensity class on uh, complex, adapt complex adaptive system in the mid-90s when I was at RAND, so I know a little bit about chaos theory, too. But I think my comparison is different. Is, uh, we should replace game theory with prospect theory, uh, which I think is a much more appropriate template for thinking about deterrence. I also, you know, I had a fleeting moment where this was very strange to me. I found myself much more in agreement with Patricia than with Mark Fitzpatrick. It's usually the other way around. I thought that Mark was overdoing a little bit the deterrence success and failure metrics because deterrence can be said to have succeeded or failed only if it was meant, if, only if it has been exercised in the first place. Is that the, I don't have my glasses. I can't see what you're <laughs> Two final remarks. Two final remarks. The extended debate in Europe, extended deterrence debate is no longer about non-proliferation, whereas it was a lot about non-proliferation during the Cold War. Avoiding a nuclear hegemony was a huge part of the extended deterrence debate. Now, I know that some of you will say, well, what about Turkey? Well, we could have a broader conversation about that, but if Turkey was ever tempted to go nuclear, I don't think it would be mainly because of a loss of confidence in the U.S. protection. I think it would be mostly because it does not want, it does not want to be protected by the U.S. anymore. So, final remark, um, there is one place in the world where the uh, NATO system could be imitated. Uh, that's the Arabian Peninsula. And if one day we have Pakistani warheads under Pakistani control on Saudi soil, then, you know, Islamabad and Riyadh will say, hey, we're just doing what you guys have been doing for decades. So when we start the conversation about these with our Saudi friends, um, maybe we should think about how much the three no's, for instance, could be a template for uh, being implemented in the other parts of the world. The three no's of 1997. Maybe that could be a good example of uh, the sort of things we would like to hear from our friends in these strange parts of the world. Thank you.